can talk from the Franz Kafka's famous book, Transformation. So maybe many, many of you have read when you were teenagers, maybe you have forgotten, so I will explain that. Yeah? Um, a man, in the morning, he woke up and found himself as a fly. And this, is, this sounds like really stupid, and it's, it sounds like very novel literature thing, but it could happen for you tomorrow, I would say, because, <laughs> and it sounds more silly, but, <laughs> but because, this is because everybody believes that the genetic material is very stable, like a metal plate or metal mold. So make the same thing all day, every day, forever. But it turned out, recent molecular biology had found out, actually it's not, it may not be true. The thing is that, that there are lots of things regulating those genes to make different animal forms. But the, so the subtle difference in the, in the regulation of genes would create a big change, but the in environmental stress can cause uh, this subtle change in the regulation. But we still don't know what, what's the consequence, the real consequence of this to, in the evolution of biology or what's the future impact uh, in the impact in, under climate change. So this is my focus. I want to understand the role of environmental stress in the evolution in the past and also in the future impact. And I'm using a model organism called sea squat or tunicate. And in this, this is a set of organisms about this size. And it's a filter feeding organism. So it has a, a two siphons, one taken in the water and the other one taken out of the water and just they, uh, it feeding the things in the, in the water. But it, and the, as the floor I just mentioned, actually this was described as mollusks in the uh, 18th century uh, by Linnean. And, uh, but it turned out this has got a tadpole larval looking, uh, tadpole look like larval stage. So it has a simple body plan. It has head, it, it actually contains trunk, a big tail, more tail tail. And it's, it's, it has got a precursor of uh, bird, uh, backbone and brain and central nervous system. So it's a really simple, but it's quite similar to vertebrate basic body plan. And uh, all the molecular biology also suggests that actually they are the closest uh, living uh, animal group of chordates, uh, the, of the vertebrates. It's included in chordates. And um, <coughs> so the, this, the, in the, one of the species of tunicates called cyanointestinalis has been really well studied because of this. Uh, they are very close to vertebrates. Maybe they, we, have, we can uh, find out some implication to vertebrate biology with simpler uh, animal body form. And also, actually, they have very simple genome. So this, uh, th this genome size is about 1% of these vertebrates. So it's much, much smaller. So it's very useful in a comparative biology using genomics. But it surprisingly, it's turned out about five years ago, somebody uh, from Japan, actually, uh, the, the first, first genome sequence has been done in California and in collaboration with Japanese uh, universities and French universities. And they, they used the uh, um, Pacific uh, species of sound intestinalis. <coughs> And then later on, one Japanese school, uh, person went, went to Britain for postdoc, and she wanted to work on cyanointestinalis further and try to find out some genome, piece of genome sequence from there. And she collected some uh, sea squirts from Britain and, and do some P PCRs like a, a machine reaction to find the piece of fragment from the genome. And she couldn't do it. And she thought, it's funny. So she, she tried to find out uh, uh, other parts of the genome, but she couldn't find it. So in the end, she sequenced all, uh, uh, some of the fragments and compared with the uh, species from Pacific and found out actually there are two different species. And uh, it's, uh, it's about the difference is about 10%, so it's not very much. Uh, and it, um, the molecular biology suggested that the divergence time, the, when the species became two, was about 20, 25 million years ago, which is geological time. It's not like yesterday. But uh, it's uh, long enough to see the genomic difference, but close enough 
to compare them, to identify which genome part is important or responsible for what uh, kind of character. And also, the later on in 2007, another uh, Chinese, uh, I don't know, Italian researchers find out that the two species are living in a very different place in the world. So one species called type B is living in a, a North Atlantic, the, the habitat is very limited in North Atlantic, whereas the other species is in, lives in the Pacific and uh, Mediterranean Sea, so they are kind of uh, adapted to warmer, nicer, no nice, uh, warm area. So I thought, oh, maybe, maybe they have, they are adapted to different environments and they have different reactions to temperature stress. So when I was, when I was, um, when you supported for me uh, at AXA Research Fund first round, um, I, I was uh, awarded the postdoctoral post run award in 2008. And um, I went to Plymouth, which is, which is uh, where we can collect type A and B, type B at the same place, it's, which is very exceptional in the world. And I, pl I collected two of them and compare how they react to temperature. Basically, I don't want to explain this. If this is very, this sounds quite torturing, but I like this animal, so that's why I do it. So please understand. <laughs> um, I put the embryo, developing embryo, in a warmer temperature. They are a little bit shocked. And type B become basically like, <laughs> type A is normally swimming happily. So this means that the type A and type B is reacting very differently, and type B is very, um, not very good at the warmer temperature. So I just thought it, it would be interesting to investigate the genome difference so that to find out which genome part is important to adapt, adapt to different temperature environment. So that's what I'm currently doing, and uh, this is comparative approach. And the other thing I'm interested in is how this modern science, uh, this environmental stress, will change genome in what way and how does it fix to evolution. And yesterday I gave a similar talk and then Joe suggested, oh, you are the monk here, you know? <laughs> maybe, maybe that's slightly true, because in the sense that how the environmental um, effect will be um, brought into evolutionary biology. But the problem of Lamarckism is, in a, in a Lamarckian time, we didn't know the genetic material. So we, uh, he couldn't explain how the adapted uh, character could be inherited. But in my case, my study is uh, in the um, comparative genomic side, so we are, uh, I'm investigating the, what kind of genome, genetic change or genome exchange can be caused by environment. So in a sense, it could be a, a little bit challenge of French revenge to uh, that, uh, British Darwinism. But I'm hiding it because I'm studying Oxford. It's quite dangerous. I will be assassinated. But anyway, um, in, the, in the future, I'll be, um, um, I'm hoping I could, by studying this, uh, comparing these two organisms and experimentally doing his stress and examining the genome, I'm hoping to uh, get a new insight, novel insight, into um, how the heat of stress would cause the evolution of change, and also what the, uh, what the consequence of climate change in the future. Thank you very much. Any questions? Can you think of other species that could be interesting to look into, or subspecies maybe? Yes, there will be lots of other species we should look at. But I, I chose them this because the genome site is so small, so we can do it very easily. And we and there must be lots of other examples, but I think this is the easiest model to work on from the beginning.